everyone! Welcome to episode number 573 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by you know who. Yep, that's me. Amelia Dalton. My guest today is David Jednak from Curtis Wright, and we're talking all about the past, present, and future of VITA standards. We also explore how VITA standards could be expanded into broader markets like critical infrastructure and medical applications, and where David sees VITA headed in the next 30 years. Also this week, I check out how diamonds could hold the key to next-generation cooling for electronic systems. But first, please welcome David to Fish Fry. Hi, David. Thank you so much for joining me. It's good to be here. Thank you. So, David, we're talking about expanding Vita into broader markets today. But first, how do you see the adoption of Vita standards changing over the years? With regard to adoption, what I hope to see is more markets, when I say a market, some sort of industry, the segments within those industries, adopting the standards. Now, the standards are ANSI standards. I mean, they're national standards, so they can be adopted freely by anybody. But I'd like to see them used and leveraged by more industries and segments of those industries that are really looking for a higher class of embedded computing and infrastructure computing for their needs, for reliability, for safety, for overall expansion of capability. So we're talking about expanding Vita into broader markets. The concept of boards and backplanes in boxes isn't new, right? This concept has been around for a long time. Absolutely, it's been around for a long time. What was interesting is I was visiting Johnson Space Center in the early part of January this year, and they've got a big Saturn V there all in pieces so you can look inside. And you know, I peeked my head and looking in there and where the lunar lander went, there's a bunch of computer boxes and they're all board and backplane, right? These things go back a long time. That was the 1960s. There's things that go across multiple different industries. In fact, Vita itself grew out of old Eurocard form factors. So this concept isn't new. It isn't something we have to go explain to people how to do boards going into a backplane in some sort of box. It's an easy thing to understand. It's been in other industries for quite a while. It's not something that's unique to defense. So it shouldn't be a problem in terms of that portion of the discussion. Okay. So from a Vita standards point of view, where should we go from here? From a standards point of view, we need to look at the level of ruggedization that's already baked into the base version of the standards, it's already designed for fairly harsh environments. We need to look at how to spec less harsh, but still not a consumer electronics sort of environment. So we have standards with regard to the environmental specifications, whether it be temperature, vibration, or whatnot, that we need to start despecking some of those things and say, okay, what would it be if we were in a fixed install under a bridge? Obviously a harsh environment, but it's not on the move. So we need to look at those things. We also need to look at some of the other requirements that we bake into the system that are looking to provide the highest, highest, highest performance and realize that in some of the other places we need to go, we don't need the highest performance. We do need the reliability, but we don't need that highest performance as pushing sort of the boundaries of top performance like we need in defense. So it really is an overall assessment of other markets, what are their key pain points and how do we compare those to our current standards and figure out how, number one, what works you know, straight across, no changes, and which items we need to create some new chapters or some new chunks of our standards to say, this is how we describe this other environment for this other industry, so that it's very clear as to what people need to design and build to. So speaking of other industries, what other kinds of markets or industries should we be looking at in particular? Definitely looking in general at everything that's called critical national infrastructure. And so when you look at that, you're looking at areas that are soft targets, if you will, for adversaries or just natural disasters, et cetera. So looking at things like roadway monitoring, railway, looking at various agriculture energy, and other sorts of production where there are systems that 
are outdoors, they're maybe indoors, they're in an environment where things need to be fairly high reliability that could benefit from the experience from Vita. When you look at all of those in critical infrastructure, there's some common threads there with security, there's common threads with reliability, there's common threads even with how things are acquired and purchased and budgeted and wear out cycles. So there's some good commonality there. There are other areas to look at as well. There are you know, maybe worthwhile looking at medical. There's some things in medical that we might be able to provide some benefit to. There's potentially some benefit even in industries like broadcast, where there's a lot of higher and higher technology moving out to the edge, when the edge for broadcast, so electronic news gathering or other origination, where there do need to be very sophisticated things in the field that could benefit from this. The other area too, just in general, is Industry 4.0, where we're putting more and more intelligence into sort of the infrastructural IoT, Internet of Things, it's in factories, et cetera. So you look at all of those different areas where computing, networks, even displays, all these different things that kind of circle around the Vita world could all be of some sort of use beyond just the standard consumer electronics type use. Fantastic. Now, Let's talk about concrete steps forward here, David. Where should we go? Absolute first step is really those market assessments. We need to understand, here's a long list of markets, a bunch of ideas. Let's start digging into those and find out what exists today. Some of those markets will be wide open and there's not really any sort of standard or de facto standard in those markets. Other ones will be a little bit more entrenched. So understanding, number one, what those target markets is, you know, that's your first step. The second step in there is the read across. Okay, what are the environmental requirements? What are the security requirements? What are the maintenance concepts? How often are things expected to be maintained? What sort of cost is in their total cost of ownership? Speaking of cost, what are the sort of the financial constraints? And say, you know, they use cheap equipment and replace it every six months versus, you know, hey, we want this to work for 20 years without anybody touching it. Reading all those things across to what we have in Vita today will be that very critical next step. After that, now that we've done our sort of identification of which markets, then our comparing contrast versus what we have, then it's setting out to start identifying and codifying those requirements, getting them in to draft VITA standards in participation with industry vendors, as well as the target industry, and work on making sure it's optimized correctly, whether that's a performance thing or a price thing or both or, or whatnot, going forward and doing all of that. That tracks what we did in defense, where we understood defense requirements, understood where it was, what we could do, and then looking over to that and saying, okay, what are the things that we need to do in the standards to meet the defense standards kind of in mass? Okay, so David, what actions should be taken by the VITA standards body, do you think? Definitely setting up bare minimum a working group of some sort to go off and do the steps I just talked about, which is go and do that market identification and start doing that initial compare and contrast. That initial set of steps is something that I think VITA within the body could set off to do and put together a plan and, and go make that happen. All right, so... Where do you see Vita headed in the next, say, 30 years? Off-world. So speaking of harsh environments, I see one of the biggest things for Vita that's an easy one is that Vita is very well positioned to help us with off-world expansion. We've seen movement with Vita providing standards for low Earth orbit and beyond. That'll be a big one as we have other industries moving into low Earth orbit and beyond. So you look at mining and whatnot in the next few decades. That time frame of 30 years is fairly broad. So I can say things like going off world, you know, SBCs getting changed out on a station or a base or something somewhere else. If I pull that in a little bit to like more of the 15 years, everything I've been talking about, I think we can see Vita hitting new things in public infrastructure, electrification, more capability with rail systems, more capability with critical infrastructure, et cetera. Those are all the things that I think Vita should be very strongly pushing into. In parallel, we'll see Vita carried off world with industry as well as government doing things off world. Excellent. All right, David, it is time for your off the cuff question. So if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there. 
what would you have? The chicken cutlet curry with brown rice, spinach and mushrooms, medium spicy from Hurry Curry of Tokyo in West Los Angeles, California. Like that. Very specific answer. What makes you want this particular thing? That is a family favorite, and it only exists pretty much there. It was in a Rolling Stone review once upon a time. That author's statement was that it would be their death row meal. And it is something that the last time we were in Los Angeles, just a few months ago, we actually went there with our little kids. And it is definitely a favorite. I used to eat there quite often. It was right near where I lived. It's very good. It's essentially Japanese curry. It's great vibe, great food. Stop there on my way to the honeymoon with my wife. It's definitely good food. So that is it and easily something I can say. I love it. Well, David, this was awesome. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you much for having me. Appreciate it. Could diamonds hold the key to next generation cooling for electronic systems? A team of scientists at Fraunhofer seem to think so. They have discovered that diamond nanomembranes that are thinner than a human hair can potentially reduce the local heat load of electronic components, like current regulators in electric motors, by a factor of 10. Even further, when these diamond nanomembranes are used within charging infrastructures, they could help those charging speeds increase by five times current rates. So how exactly are these diamond nanomembranes going to be used? Well, they will be placed in between the layer of copper and the component on a PCB. So by replacing this normally oxide or nitrate intermediate layer with a diamond nanomembrane, this team contends that this membrane would be extremely effective at transferring heat to the copper and can be processed into conductive paths. And because this nanomembrane is freestanding and flexible, this team also says that this nanomembrane could be positioned anywhere on the component, on the copper, or even integrated directly into the cooling circuit. So diamond heat spreading isn't a new thing. But now, normally these heat spreaders are around 2 millimeters thick and can be a bit tricky to attach to the components. But these new nanomembranes are much thinner, only around a micrometer thick, and can be bonded to electric components by heating them to only around 80 degrees Celsius or 176 degrees Fahrenheit. So this team was able to manufacture these diamond nanomembranes by growing polycrystalline diamond on top of silicon wafers and then detaching and etching the diamond layers. And maybe the best part because the diamond nanomembranes can be made on silicon wafers, the manufacturing process should be relatively easy to scale up for industrial use. And as you can probably guess, this team has already filed a patent for this new technology. They also plan on starting to test these diamond nanomembranes in inverters and transformers in electric vehicles and telecommunications later this year. Cool, right? Sparklingly cool even. <laughs> so if you want even more information about these new diamond nanomembranes, Vita or Curtis Wright, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com. 
Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are now on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash EE Journal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And, of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I promise my voice will be much better next week. <laughs> if you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of March 15th, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>